What's up, y'all? It's your man, Stephen Bardo, coming at you with another edition of Bardo's Breakdown. I'm your host, and I've got one of my adversaries and one of my good friends on with me today, uh, Michigan great, professional basketball great, Sean Higgins. How you doing, brother? I'm good, Steve, man. How you feeling? I'm doing well, man. I'm, I'm glad we finally connected. I've been trying to get you on here for a minute, and I know like you're a busy year, man. Right, right? Yeah. Oh, it's it's going to be fun, man. Uh you know, Sean has been um, uh, regular with Bartles Breakdown. He's a great supporter. He's part of the tribe. So we, we love finally getting him in front of the camera instead of behind the camera. So, uh, Sean, first of all, first off, man, how's your family and how's everybody doing with this COVID-19 situation? Hey, man, we're just trying to do the right things, man. Stay in the house as much as we can and, you know, just keep everything, you know, copacetic on our end, man. It's, it's tough times for everyone, man, but we're just trying to do our part. Do you know anybody that's been affected personally by this? I don't, man. I know I have some family members and friends who have, but I don't know anyone personally who's been affected by it. Well, let's hope this stays that way, man, because this thing is its something else. It's crazy. No uh, question about it. I mean, it, it, it came out of nowhere, man. No one expected it. And, you know, this once this thing is over, man, we're going to have to make some adjustments in terms of our daily living habits. You're right about that. You're yeah. right on that. So, Sean, I, I like to start when we do these uh, type of interviews. I like to start at the beginning. What, what was the first – who introduced you to the game of basketball? How did you come across uh, the game of basketball? Man, you know, it's crazy because, you know, I grew up in Ann Arbor. You know, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, and I grew up in Ann Arbor until I was 11 years old. My first sport was football because my uncles, both of my mother's brothers, played football. Mm. I didn't play basketball until I was probably about – Nine years old, I was playing Vince Lombardi football, and uh, that's what they called him in Michigan at the time, Vince Lombardi football for Little League. And um, one day I picked up an Eastern Michigan yearbook, and I saw my dad in the, in the yearbook. Mm. And my dad didn't grow up, in, I didn't grow up in a household with my father, but he was an All-American at Eastern Michigan, and I saw my dad in Eastern Michigan's yearbook. So, you know, most boys, they want to be like their fathers. And so I just I just start emulating, you know, the things that I saw. And then in Ann Arbor, my dad played high school basketball in Ann Arbor at Pioneer High School, which was right next to the big house. Oh, I know Pioneer High School. I know yeah. about that. Yeah. And and he was a legend. So now I used to go up to the parks, all the old heads used to say, that's Earl Higgins' son. And so I used to walk around, stick my chest out, and, you know, it made me feel good. So I just fell in love, in love with basketball, man, because of my father. So you grew up in the Ann Arbor uh, area, and so you were in the shadows of the University of Michigan uh, pretty much the whole time until you said 11, right? Yeah. And then you guys, you, you and your family moved out to Southern California after that? My, my mother and my great-grandmother, man, we moved to Las Vegas uh, first in 1978. Okay. okay. And you know, that's why I live in Vegas now, because I got a lot of family out here on my mother's side. And... Um, you know, it was cold back then, man. You know, my grandmother was 68 at the time. And, you know, that cold was getting to her arthritis. So we had to move. And, uh, you know, when I first got to, to Las Vegas, I played on a, a, a traveling team called the Las Vegas Silver Stars. Greg Anthony was the point guard. Mm. Greg Anthony from UNLV. Yes, sir. And then uh, around the seventh grade, I moved to Southern California from Las Vegas. My mom got married, and then we moved to Southern California. Okay. And so you find yourself in a new situation. And typically I talk to a lot of, a lot of people who've been moving around. Chris Broussard had a, a, a childhood where he moved a lot. And one of the things he said was that sports was a universal language whenever you were the new cat. If you come into a new scenario and you could hoop, you kind of got some love based on that. Was that, is that how it worked for you? That's exactly how it worked for me, man. I fit in well. You know, in Southern California back in the early 80s, man, the gangbanging culture was real big. And so I used to get a pass in the neighborhood we lived in because I was tall and I could hoop. And, you know, the one thing I tell people is, like, when I made it to the pros, man, I, I used to tell guys, I was like, I wasn't the best player in my neighborhood. You guys mm -hmm. just never heard of some of these guys. That's right. You know, and I can go down the list of guys you've never heard of, and I couldn't guard them. I mean <laughs> – and, and so, you know, I got respect because, you know, I could play. But when I first got to the West Coast, man, I used to talk a lot of Detroit smack. I used to, I used to talk a lot of stuff, man, to guys. I'm like, you guys didn't move. I never wanted to move to the West Coast. 
you know, I remember the day we got ready to pack up the U-Haul, man, and my uncles drove our U-Haul out here from Michigan. You know, my mom and my grandmother, we got on the plane. I cried like a baby. <laughs> and said, well, call your father, see if you can stay with him. And uh, he said, why you don't want to move to the West Coast? I said, they don't play basketball in California on the West Coast? <laughs> no, that's a true story. Yeah, he turned me on to the Lakers. I knew nothing about the Lakers. You ever heard about the Lakers? I said, yeah. He said, that's the West Coast. And so when I first got out here, man, I talked a lot of Detroit smack. People on the West Coast will tell you, I was Detroit to the heart. <laughs> oh, that's that's dope there, man. See, I, yeah. I didn't I didn't know you rep so hard for Detroit. And that's, that's kind of cool being in a different area of the country repping Detroit out in LA. So you get you come out to Southern California, you start in the ball. I'm sure you probably had a, a choice of high schools you wanted wanted to go to. Why did yeah, you man, choose? I got recruited before I went to college. I was being recruited out of junior high school, like we all were. And and so my mother got tired of all the guys call all the coaches calling the house. And so she told me, she said, this is gonna be a big fish in a small pond. And that's how I ended up at Fairfax High School. They were 3A at the time. They're 4A now, but I dominated 3A. I got City Bear of the Year at 15. And, wow. and so, you know, I, I made Fairfax what it is today in terms of a basketball power. It was a, a, a theater school for drama. Like, I went to school with a lot of actors that you see on television now. Okay. So it, the choice of Fairfax was because you could get in and play right away? Is that what it was? that the decision? No, that's not what it was, man. See, what I did first, you know, I wanted to play against the best, right? I almost went to Crenshaw High School and played with Stevie Thompson and went to Syracuse. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I had to take – the reason why I didn't go to Crenshaw is because I had to take three buses. And oh. I'm talking about not not going to school after practice. It's about 6, 7 o'clock at night. Right. I had to go through three sets. You know what sets are on the West Coast? Game yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, my mother wasn't going to let me do that. And so, see, so I ended up going to Hamilton, which was in Crenshaw's division. And so it was a 4A school. And then the coach at Fairfax, Harvey Katani, you know, he's an L.A. Coach, high school coach and legend now. Um, and he saw me at the bus stop one time. And he asked me if I was Sean Higgs, and he's Asian. So I thought he was a fan. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, yeah. I said, he said, where do you live? I pointed to my apartment complex. And the next day, they pulled me out of Hamilton and made me go to Fairfax. <laughs> he, went, he snitched on me. So I tell him every day, I said, you were a snitch. You know, I made you a legend because he snitched on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, oh, that's what happened. So he. That's what happened. He, he, he turned your name in. And so yeah, he, he turned my name into the school district. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's a great story. No, so, that's a real story. Because I, I, I would end up playing against Stevie Thompson twice a year. If I went to Hamilton, because they were in the same division. Right. You know, I want to play against the best. So they, my, my mother made me go to Fairfax. She said, it's going to be a big fish in a small pond. Mm -hmm. I remember in the city championship, my 10th grade year, Marcus Johnson, the great Marcus Johnson, commentated. Yep. And he said, they're going to move. They're going to move this guy out of 3A, man. He's going to dominate this for the next two years. <laughs> and so, you know, I ended up, you know, they moved Fairfax up to 4A, and then we ended up winning the city championship in that that uh, at, at that level too. Mm. Okay. So, how tough was it, Sean, being one of the better players in Southern California, being a high school All American, and all of the distractions? You you mentioned the gang situation with the women. I know drugs were around. How were you able to stay on the straight and narrow and avoid all, all the stuff that could have derail what you were trying to do? My mother, man, she was a beast. Rest in peace. My, I lost my mother in 2016, but my mother didn't play. Okay. You know, she was a straight up, you know, Chassis High School, west side of Detroit. You know, my great grandmother from Shaw, from Shaw Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't play with me, man. You know, you know, every, every whooping I got, I deserved. <laughs> hey, but you know what? Those whoopings saved you. Those whoopings saved me, man. Saved me too. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, I, I see what you talk. When you talk about your dad, and you know, I always tell people. I say my mother was my dad, and my great grandmother was my mother. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they were a tandem. Yeah, that's and then, right. And then I had my mother's uncles too. I mean, my mother's brothers, my uncles. Mm -hmm. you know, they were no joke either. You know, Northern High School in Detroit, where Derek Coleman went. Oh, That's yeah. where both of my uncles went to school and played football over there on the west side. 
Okay. And, you know, they used to, they, they used to put them dogs on me. <laughs> That's all right, man. So you dominated Fairfax High School. You become a McDonald's All-American. You have your choice of anywhere you want to go to college. Uh, who, are, who are like your top three to five choices? Well, I, I narrowed it down to five schools. I took a visit to um, Louisville, Kentucky, the University of Texas, UCLA, and Michigan. Mm. And so those are my top five schools. Great choices. Mm -hmm. uh, what, which, which school were you leaning towards? If you, did, if you didn't go to Michigan, which one of those schools were you leaning towards? And well, I mean, you know, everyone knows, the, you know, the infamous, infamous story of, you know, UCLA and the letter of intent and the coercion when I came out of high school. And so I signed with UCLA first, and then uh, the NCAA let me out the letter because I was under 18 when I signed it. Okay. You know, I was coerced into signing that letter because, you know, some people in my family was taken, you know, under the table, you know. Yep. And, and so, you know, I, me and my mother was in the blind on it. And so... Once they let me out my letter of intent, the NCAA told me, they said, uh, you can go anywhere you want. And they said, but if you go to Michigan and we find out some wrongdoings, we're going to ban you from the NCAA. Really? And so when they told me that, I almost went to Louisville. You know, I called Denny Crum. And, and I almost went to Louisville. They said, if you, we find any wrongdoings, because they knew I wanted to go to Michigan. Michigan was my choice. Okay. And no one, no one in my family, no one on the West Coast wanted me to go to Michigan because a lot of people on the West Coast didn't know I was from Detroit, really. They, they thought I was a West Coast kid. Okay. And so, you know, they was like, why would you want to go back there to the snow? I'm like, I grew up in the snow. <laughs> right. And, 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 and I just fell in love with the guys on the team, man. You know, we had a lot in common because we all from Michigan. Only yep. person on our team that wasn't from the Midwest was Ramil. Mm. And so, so we, 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 we had a common ground. And right. so that's what it was, man. But when they told me that, I, I, I talked to Denny Crum, and this is a true story. Denny Crum called me and said, if, if you give me a verbal commitment, I'll start recruiting the Bradford Smith and Jerome Harmon right now. Mm. And, and I, I, I always tease him. I said, man, if I signed with Louisville, y'all never would have been able to go to Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, Le for those that don't know the Bradford Smith, uh, the first round draft pick in the NBA. Uh, yeah, he could play. Could play. Ball. Ball. Yeah, that Jordan game messed him up in the league. You know when he gave Jordan thirty eight. Yep. And Jordan came back and dropped like forty eight on him the next night. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so Sean, wait a minute. T take me back to you had you had family members that you were unaware of that were taking benefits. From well, let, let's be specific, man. It wasn't members. It was my stepfather. Oh. Yeah, it, it's been documented in Sports Illustrated. You can Google it. Okay. The, the title of the article is called Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. No, Signed, Sealed, and Sorry. Okay. That's the title of the article. 1987, they had magic on the cover. Okay. Walk us through that a little bit, Sean, about how that all transpired and how you found out about it. Well, I found out about it because he was going through my mail, and then... You know, I, I, you know, at 17, I was a little more cognitive of what was going on around me because of all the recruitment. And, you know, I didn't really like the recruiting process. So, you know, it was, it was a headache. And, you know, my mother detected it, and she didn't let me know about it. She just went along with it until, you know, as they say, that you know what hits the fan. Right. And right. that's what pretty much happened. And so when I found out about it, man, I was, you know, I was deterred and, and disturbed and, you know, I had a lot of emotions behind it because, you know, I thought my mother knew about it. But then when she told me she didn't know about it and this guy was pulling a stunt, you know, it was, it was time for me to go. Okay. And so that, that's really what it was, man. You know, the coach at the time in UCLA was Walt Hazard. And, you know, rest in peace. You know, and I told Walt, I said, if you was at any other school, I would come play for you. Um, but at the time, UCLA, they, they were in the gutter, man. And, and the guys that they had on the squad at the time, I'd already played against them in the travel ball system, the AAU and all that stuff. You know, I, I wanted to be challenged every day. You know, when you dominate guys, you don't want to really have those. I, you know, I was like LeBron James. You know, LeBron, they, they criticized LeBron because he wants to play with good players on his level, guys who think the game. That's why I went to Michigan, man. I want to be challenged every day in practice. I want to play with guys give me a chance to win a championship. 
Because in high school, I always fell short of winning the state. I never won a state championship. Okay. You know, I'm all about winning, Steve. I'm not about, you know, stats and all the, you know, the hoopla and, and the accolades. You know, that helps you along the way. But when I was in high school, man, I wanted to win. And so that's why I chose Michigan. UCLA didn't have that type of pedigree at the time. You know, they had the tradition. But right. at that time, 87, you know, they were, they were down a little bit. They didn't get a lot of TV action. You know, I was seeing Michigan on TV against David Robinson and Navy, North Carolina. You know, I was watching the fight in the line. And, and I grew up in Big Ten country like I just spoke about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my heart's always been maize and blue, man. You know, I could hear the fight song when I was a little kid from my apartment on Saturdays, the football games. And so it was just in my blood. That's, that's, that's cool right there, man. I, I love that. I love how you broke that down. Uh, so you get to Michigan and – Everybody has a transition period where something gets rocky. You know, you might not get along with the coach. Some guys have a period where they think about transferring. Did any of those situations happen to you when you first got to Michigan? Man, come on, man. Look, a lot of times, because when I first got to Michigan, you know what I used to do on my recruiting trips, Steve? What's that? I used to always ask guys, I mean, how much, how much running do y'all do up here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and all the guys on Michigan, they told me, we don't run that much, man. We don't do all that running. You know, you know, Freeze let us play. Uh -huh. First day of practice, man, that's all we did was run. <laughs> and so I said, nigga, I said, I'm not a track star, man. I'm a basketball player. Right. <laughs> and they said, you either going to run or you're not going to play. Yep. And, 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 and it helped me, man. You know, it, it really did, man, Ben. And that's the reason why I chose Michigan. You know, I, I was challenged every day in practice. Well, it's interesting. Sean, I got Sean Higgins with me today on Bartle's Breakdown. Sean and I are talking about that transition from high school to college. Sean's at Michigan. I remember at Illinois, Sean, Lou Henson and the, the coaching staff, they came into your house and they sit there and talk to you and your parents and they seem so nice and all that. Man, when you get to campus, them jokers flip the switch. Oh, like, man, it's totally different. They basically lie to you when they come to your home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it, 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 it's happened to all of us. And it, you're mm -hmm. sitting there looking at the dude in preseason conditioning like, man, this ain't the same cat that was in my house. At all. Was Frieda like that? Yeah, you know what? Frieda was laid back, man, as long as you handled your business. If you didn't handle your business, he'd get in your butt. Okay. But, um, you know, I, I, I got turned around pretty quick, man. You know, I played with a guy by the name of Glenn Rice. And, and so, <laughs> and so, and so, like real talk, you know, and you know, we're in our fifties now. I keep it real. Glenn Rice, the only dude to ever bust my ass. For real? Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you the story. We were. I played the McDonald's game. Me and Lib was on the same McDonald's team. Sonny Cox was our coach from King High School. Yep. And and after the McDonald's game, we had two weeks off of spring break. I signed my letter of intent with Michigan at the McDonald's game in Philadelphia. Okay. And, and, and after the McDonald's game, I went up to Ann Arbor for two weeks for break. And they finally told me what it was. They said they all went over Glenn Rice's house and watched you play in the McDonald's game. All my teammates were sitting there watching me. And so when I got up there, they had just lost to David Robinson in Navy in, uh, in the tournament. Mm -hmm. And so they were just hooping up in Chrysler, no coaches. And so my father drove me up to Ann Arbor because I want to play. I want to hang out with my new teammates. It was nobody in Chrysler except my father sitting in the stands and Glenn Rice destroyed me. I mean, I mean, man. I, it, ooh, we. And, and, so, and, so, and so we got in the car and drove back to Detroit from Ann Arbor. It was about 45 minutes. You know, Rice, all he needed was an inch to get that jumper off. Man, who you tell? And, and, and I found out that all my big man, they, they were targeting him. They were setting screens on me. You know, because mm. Rice wasn't a great ball handler. But once he get open, he square up. He, that's money all night. Yes, sir. And so when we got in the car, me and my father, we didn't talk the whole ride back to Detroit. And, and we pulled up in the garage. He looked at me. He said, you know what you got to do, don't you? I said, man, I got to get stronger, man. That dude's strong. <laughs> and he can shoot. Yeah. So when I went back to California, man, that's all I did was work out, work out. So when I got back to California, it was a, a whole other story. G. Rice would tell you. We used to have battles. Okay. <laughs> man, so I'm trying to remember. So Lloyd Vaught, Terry Mills, Glenn Rice, Mike Griffin, 
Demetrius uh, Caleb. Caleb. Yep. Was Eric Riley there? Eric Riley was red shirt. Okay, he was red shirt. Obviously, Glenn. Um, man, who am I missing on that team when you first got Bill, there? Mark Hughes. Yep. Yep. Yep, that's it. Man. Rob Pelink, Rob Pelink was on the bench when we played you guys. Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> the Rob. The of the Lakers. Yeah, I remember, I remember Rob Pelinka being on the squad. He's from uh, Illinois. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, Sean, how did you find your way with all that talent? I know you were talented as well. And you, you really found a niche within that team. How did you develop your niche? I'm going to tell you, man, you know, um, my so I only played 72 games in Michigan. I mm -hmm. scored 900 points in 72 games. That's putting it and, up. And, and so um, what happened was when we played the tournament, you know, I started that year. I was starting. And, and when Fisher took over, he came to my hotel to the hotel room. We were on the road one night and said, you know, I want to bring you off the bench. And I was mad. I was they gonna put Mike Griffin ahead of me. Come on, man. And but he told me, he made me real. I'm a young kid, 19 years old. Right. And he said, You're too versatile to start. Mm. He said, I can bring you off the bench for two, three different guys. Wow. And so I said, Coach, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. You know, that Virginia game before we played you, I scored 30 before we played you guys, I scored 31 in 20 minutes off the bench. Wow. And so, you know, Fisher, he was smart, man. Rich East High School in Illinois. Yep. And 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 so, you know, that's something that made me understand my game. You know, at first, you know, you know, you come into Michigan with all that hype, man. You think you're gonna be the man, you know, yep. you come out of high school. Yeah. And and so it humbled me, but it also gave me some knowledge and insight on who I really was as a basketball player. You know, I could pass, I could dribble, I could shoot. But when I got to Michigan, I had to taper my game down because the guys on our team, they were all of them could play. That's right. When I first got there, we had Gary Grant, the general, my freshman year. Woo! Yeah. One of the most I underrated mean, bad players. boys. Uh, he's and, one of the most. So that, yeah. So that, that's why when I told you in the beginning of our conversation about, you know, LeBron and I, you know, I, I, LeBron shares my birthday. We both born on December 30th. And, and, and guys who think the game – they won't play with guys who they can pass to. That's right. You understand? And, and I have guys to pass to. You know, like my high school team, I'll tell you a story about my high school team. My 10th grade year, I was the youngest guy on the team. All my seniors had graduated after we had just won a championship, and they can really move us up to 4A against the Crenshaws, the Hamiltons, and all the top teams in California. I went out and recruited Chris Mills and J.D. Green. You know, I, I, I was recruiting in the 10th grade, man. I remember going to Chris's house and begging his daddy on my 10th speed, like, let him come play with me because I got all these college coaches packing my gym. He going to be seen. And, and Chris so, Mills was seen because he ended up in Kentucky. Good boy, right. man. Ooh. Yeah. Good. You know, I remember Chris, man, when he used to ride skateboards and bikes. He didn't want to play basketball. I used to make him go to the courts. Mm. And, and, and he'll tell you that. But I saw a lot in him, man. He had toughness. He could jump. He could jump back then. Yes, he, could. he didn't have a lot of skills, but he could jump. And then I, we worked out every day. Chris, you could come out my apartment building and walk across the hall into his apartment building. Mm, okay. We all lived in the same building. You know, it was some, you know some stuff going on, so we all get in the district. Sure. And so, <laughs> and, sure. so and so yeah, man. So I, I always just wanted to play with guys that could play. You know, because I never. That's why I didn't go to UCLA because I didn't want to be double teamed. You know, and, and the same with LeBron. LeBron played with big threes all the time. Go give me some studs, man, so I can see. I already can see over the defense. Right. So, but if they double team me, I'm going to be stuck like Chuck. Right. right. So, I got to play with some bad. That, that's why Marcus came to play with y'all. Yeah, he had a choice between Syracuse and Illinois. So, I mean, even if he went to Syracuse, it wouldn't have been a bad choice. It wouldn't you know? have been a bad choice, right. Yeah, because your boy Stevie Thompson was out there. During right. The so, so man, you, you get to Michigan and you're having this success. You left after your junior year, Sean? Yeah, yeah, after my junior year. Okay. And so what was that process like, making the decision to go to the NBA early? Uh, you look at your bank account, you got $20 in it. I mean, that's <laughs> it's a no-brainer. Do the math. Yeah, I got you. And so you you were getting feedback that you were going to be an early like you're going to be a first round pick 
I was, man. My agent at the time put me on a three-way conference call with Jerry Colangelo, who was the general manager of the Phoenix Suns at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, they had the last pick in the first round. And he told, I heard him say it. He said, that kid is not going to be around to the last pick in the first round. Mm. And so that gave me insight. I said, okay, I'm going to come on out, man. Then I went to the pre-draft camp in Chicago at Moody Bibles College. Yep. And, um, you know, I'll play. You know, all the top guys didn't have to play. Gary Payton, all the guys was already the seniors who were sketched to go a lot of. But I played, man. And Marty Blake, you know, he had me and Gerard Mustaf as the top players there that played. And so I, I felt good about everything, man. And I ended up slipping to the last pick. And so my rookie year, um, you know, Larry Brown was my coach my rookie year. This is halfway through the season. I wasn't where, playing where, much. Where you know, back then, picked? rookies didn't play that much. Where'd you get picked, Sean? I was 54. Okay, by who? The Spurs. That was yeah, our, yep. that, That's when you were there in that's training. Right. Yes, sir. That's right. And so Larry Brown called me to the office, him and Bob Bass, the GM. Yep. And, and he said, listen, we love everything you've been doing. You know, you've been working your butt off. You've been, you've been a good guy. He said, all the stuff we heard about you before the draft, we don't see any signs of that. And then Larry Brown chirped in and he said, you know why you slipped in the draft, right? And I said, no, I don't. I've been wondering about that. And he said, because your college coach didn't have anything good to say about you. Oh, come on. Come on, yeah, Sean. Real. Yeah. This is my first time ever saying this in public. Cost me millions. So, Sean, what? You did, I thought you had a pretty good relationship with Steve. Oh, well, I do still to this day. But you know how guys are, man. Oh, he didn't want you to come out early. He didn't want me to come out. I went ah. to his office and told him I was coming out, and I asked him to attend my press conference. He said he couldn't do it. Okay. So But then the next year, but then after that when Weber and Jalen Rose and all those boys, he supported those boys. And right. I told him, I said, You want me to tell you why I'm coming out? There's two reasons. I'm struggling up here financially. And you didn't recruit anybody. My son, he said, I'm going to give you 25 shots a game like Glenn Rice. I said, what's that going to do? We're going to lose. You didn't recruit anybody. Mm. I'm going to get double teamed. Okay. And I told you, I don't want to be double teamed. Right, right. Yeah, I don't want to be double And that team, I might have got triple teamed. <laughs> who who would have been on your squad had you stayed your senior year, Sean? A bunch of youngsters, guys who hadn't played yet, inexperienced. Okay. You know, Caleb would have been the only one. Yeah, Demetrius Caleb. Yeah, he'd have been the only one. Okay. But all the other guys were young and inexperienced. Man, we was gonna get drugged every night. So, Sean, have you have you sat down and talked to Steve Fisher about this since? Have I you wrote him a letter my my rookie year after Larry Brown told me. I wrote him a letter. And how did he respond to it? Yeah, he told me he said if you had stayed, we'd have won five more games and made the tournament. That's I mean I'm being real with you. God. That's my man. Oh, Fish is cool. He's older now, and I'm older. We were all young back sure. then. He was, I think he was 45, 46. Sure. And he was looking out for his family. Yes. And I, you know what, Sean? It, 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 it warms my heart to hear the maturity that you're speaking with because, you know, you take people from different walks of life, and if they have something like that happen to them that might sideline or derail them at the beginning, they never recover. But you mm -hmm. seem to recover because just the, just the fact that you sat down and wrote a letter that took the time to write out a letter and send it to him tells me a lot about your maturity level. So it seems yeah, you don't seem to harbor any ill will towards him. No, I don't, man. My great grandmother, man, always taught me everything happens to you happens for you. Mm -hmm. That what that why that wisdom. She was born in 1909, man. She had a sixth grade education. She didn't get her high school diploma until she was 54. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So your your people taught you how to stay strong through all that. Yeah, man. But well, she had a PhD in life, my grand great grandmother, man. There you go. There you go. So you you go to San Antonio, and I got cut, so I I left. But what what happened your rookie season? I averaged about nine minutes a game. You know, I had some good games. I had some big games. I remember one night in Houston, Larry Brown taught me, if it wasn't for Larry Brown, I wouldn't have played the, I wouldn't have had the eight years under my belt in the NBA. I played seven solid years, but I got eight years under contract. 
But Larry Brown, one time, we were in Houston, and Sean Elliott was injured. So I started that night. I had 22 points, hit the game winner against the Rockets, and got prepared of the game. And we're on the bus going back to San Antonio, and Larry comes in the back of the bus. I used to always sit in the back of the bus with the vets, Terry Cummings, Paul Presley, all those guys, because I, I was a sponge. And uh, Larry Brown walked on the back of the bus. He was trying to humble me, you know, because I used to walk around with a little swag, you know, my confidence. You know how I used to be. Yep. And, so, <laughs> and so he walked back in the back of the bus. He said, for the next two weeks, I don't want you to take a shot in practice. So I want you to focus on defense and rebounding. And I couldn't understand it. I just had 22 points. Right. And Terry Combs and David Greenwood. Remember David Greenwood? From UCLA, yep. Yeah, my rookie year, man, David Greenwood was my, my, my vet. And he took me under his wing. He had been in the league 16 years my rookie year. He said, young fella, he's trying to test you right now. Just do what he says. Mm. And I did that. And, and so that's what kept me around, man. I was coachable. There you go. Oh, young viewers. Did you hear what Sean Higgins just said? He was coachable. That's right. He didn't, he didn't, Sean didn't force his own individual agenda. He mm -hmm. adjusted to what the team wanted and ended up, uh, you know, paying off him for a long career. So how many different teams did you play with in, in the league, Sean? I played for 16, Steve. I played for the uh, Spurs, Orlando, and um, the Nets, the Sixers, uh, Golden State, and, and Portland Trailblazers. So out of each, uh, out of all those stops, and out of out of your NBA career, where did you like the best, and where was the toughest for you? Uh, Orlando, Philadelphia. I don't think I mentioned Philly. Philly, I played in Philly. Uh, Orlando and Philly. Excuse me. I had my best my best years. Okay. Who the, the toughest coach? for me was probably my rookie year, because you know me and Sean Elliott used to go at it in practice. I thought I should have been playing more. I'm not saying I should have started over Elliott. But I should have been playing more, so I used to get mad that I wasn't playing. Being young, and and so you know, they sent the Ice Man over to my house one time my rookie year, and and he knocked on my door. I live in a gated community, so they usually call the guard. So I'm like, who's just knocking at my door? I didn't get a message. He said, it's GG, young fella. And you know, he, he, you know, George wore my dad's number in Eastern Michigan. Oh, that's and so we, we kind of like family. George knew me when I was real small, man. You know, I, my mother had me when she went to my mother went to Eastern Michigan, too. OK. And, and so George knew me when I was young. I mm. mean, before I even really knew myself. So he came and sat down in my living room. He said, listen, man, you won the youngest three guys. I was one of the youngest three guys in the NBA, myself, Kemp and uh, Abdul Raouf. OK. And and he said, he said, you got two cars in the garage. You got a nice house. You got a three-year guaranteed contract. What you complaining for? Wait your turn. And so they, they sent the Iceman. He said, they love you, man. That's what they love you. And so that, that centered me down, having the Iceman come to my house, man. When he left, I called all my boys. I mean, George Gervin just left my house. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done the same thing. I've been you ain't lying. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. The Iceman. Uh, that's pretty cool, man. So where was a place that you didn't like, that you liked the least and why? Oh, man, shoot. I was in the NBA. I liked everywhere. <laughs> OK, so so then you played overseas as well, right? Uh, yeah, man. A after I got done with, um, where, where did I go to Greece? After Golden State, I went overseas. I changed agents, and I went to Greece. I played with Sam Vincent, the bird feeder from Michigan State. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, he got me off, man. I averaged about 25 in the Greek League, 21 in the Euro League. And then Willis Reed brought me back home, man. I signed a two-year deal with the Nets. Okay. Okay. How was your experience in Greece? Oh, I loved it, man. I love Greece to this day. I still have friends over there. Um, it was some of the it was one of the best times of my life playing overseas, man. I also played in Turkey in Istanbul. Mm. But um but Greece, that's my favorite, you know, my favorite place in the world is Greece. Wow. So, yeah, you, you had great experiences going overseas because some of us, I know I left six figures over there because folks are jacking around my money and whatnot, but you had, yeah. a, good, you had a good experience, huh? No, yeah, well, I, well, at the end, they owe me money still to this day. So, <laughs> you know how that was back then. Yep. People wasn't governing, governing, you know, basketball like they do now. That's right. 
That's right. Like if guys don't get paid now, nah, FIBA will step in and get you paid. Mm. But back then, you know, I made a mistake and left. When they didn't pay me, I left. Once you come back home, you can forget about your money. That's true. That's true. You, you got to stay there and fight it. That's you true. Stay there and fight it. Yep. Yeah. So after your, you did you finish at with the New Jersey Nets? Did you finish your career there? No, I got traded to Philadelphia. Went and played over there when Stackhouse was a rookie. And then um, after Philly, I went to Turkey. Played in Turkey. Then I came back from Turkey and I signed with the Trailblazers. I ended my career with the trail, well, the NBA part of my career with the Trailblazers. And okay. then after that, I ended up going to play in Russia. How was that? Cold. <laughs> but it was good, man, because the team that I played for at the time, they were an expansion team and the owner, he was loaded. And so he took care of us. My teammate was Roy Tarpey. They played in Michigan. Rest in peace. Boy, one of the best players to ever play the game. Man, if, if, he, if he'd ever stayed off that stuff, man, I'm telling you, he'd have been a Hall of Famer. There's no doubt about it. Because when, when Roy was lucid and he was, you know, he was locked in, there wasn't, I mean, Roy, Roy was, for those that don't remember, Roy Tarpley was 6'10", probably 250, 260, could handle like a point guard, could pass like a point guard, could shoot, could rebound, had post moves, uh, could defend. There wasn't anything he couldn't do on the floor, man. Nothing. I just remember the cat could drink like a case of beer a day and it wouldn't, it wouldn't do nothing to him. Yeah, man. I, I've seen him do it before. And, you know, um, you know, Roy was a different type of beast, man. Roy, Roy was – if Roy didn't have the demons that he had, man, like I said, like I watched him, he used to get the Lakers fits. Oh, 20 yeah. and 18. He, yep. he, was a, he used to kill the Lakers. He did. He and, did. and so, you know, you never know what's going on in a person's life behind closed doors. True. And, you know, I got a chance, you know, Roy and I, we got kind of close over in Russia. And, um, and you know, it, it's just a sad story, man, at the end. Right. Yeah, it was. Definitely was. So Russia was your last stop? Professional? Uh, let me see. No, Russia... What did I do after rugby? Yeah, that was my last stop, you know, playing for real. I dipped and dabbed with the little minor leagues when I came back home because I love to play. I went and played the ABA for my childhood idol back to George Gerber. He was my coach in the ABA. So I couldn't pass that up. I went and played with Ice. We won a championship. You know who we won a championship against? The Chicago Skyline. They had uh, Dallas Common Jeans. They had all this. Like Ronnie Fields. Uh, 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 what's my man's name? Booth. Uh, uh, um, David Booth? David Booth, yeah. 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 And uh, I took David Booth on his recruiting trip in Michigan. Oh, uh, OK. And, uh, and so we, we beat them the championship down in Kansas City. That was fun, man, playing for ice. And, and that was my last hurrah. OK, then, then what did you transition into after your professional career? I started doing player development, man. And then I got into coaching. I went up to Seattle and coached at a, Well, before I went to coach at the junior college, I was a head coach and general manager in the ABA for a franchise out of Fresno. Okay. And then I bought my own franchise um, and moved it to Southern California. So I was coaching there. Um, but player development, man, was my niche. I, I found that I had a niche in terms of teaching the game. And, um, and, and and I was getting successful results. So, you know, that's what I do now. Okay. What What's your organization called, Sean? Nine Star Basketball, man. NineStarBasketball.net. Okay, that's where they can find you? Yep, 9starbasketball.net. Um, you know, we're extend we're expanding right now, man. We're going nationwide, you know, with our exposure camps, our player development. What we do, we do combine camps. We don't just throw the ball out there and a lot of guys just rub it down the floor. What we do the first day, man, we do all player development stations. You know, I bring in guys, former players. The last camp we had, I had Marcus Pfizer there, mm -hmm. a couple of other college players. Remember Marcus Pfizer played for the Bulls? Um, his son was in our camp, who was yep. going to be an up-and-coming uh, junior. No, no, 10th grader. Um, but in any case, you know, we combine our camps, man. The first day is all drill work and then uh, and teaching. And then the next day, we bring the refs in and let them play. And we film it and send our, send our film out to college coaches. We're also certified by the NCAA as a uh, certified scouting service. Mm, okay. So it's, which means we can sell our reports to the schools. And so, you know, I'm out here on the grind, man, checking out this young talent all the time. Well, I know you've got a lot to offer them, man. Uh, 
So th we're wrapping up a little bit here, but I want to get a couple more things in just to get your take on this. Um, tell me how special was it, how special is it to be a Michigan man and what that means? Well, you know, the University of Michigan has such a long history, man, from a academia and, and athletic side, man. And so, you know, you see I have the block M on right now, man. And it's just, this is part of my culture. You know, that, that's a tough question, man, because it's almost like, and, and this might sound a little over the top, man, it's almost like breathing. You know, once, 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 they, once they put that in you, you know, like when I went to elementary school in Ann Arbor, man, I knew the Michigan fight song before I knew the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> yeah, I did, I man. That. They make you learn it. They yep. make you learn yep. it. Brian Elementary School off Ellsworth in Ann Arbor, Michigan, man. Where I, you know, they just embed that maize and blue in you. Mm. It's it. And, you know, because I, I, I interviewed Glenn Rice, and we talked about how important it is because a lot of people – Basketball players may not understand that when you sign, you're not signing for four years, you're signing for 40, right? And what that opportunity can do for you after you're done playing. It seems as though Michigan is as good as any school in the country in terms of post-playing career opportunities and the, and the strength of the alumni base and the fan base. Can you talk about that a little bit? That's the key, man. Listen, when I played in Greece, I had Michigan alumni coming to the games. Hmm. That, that sums it up right there. In Greece? In Greece. Wow. In Greece, man. And, and, and like, one, one of our biggest um, supporters was a Greek guy uh, by the name of Thano Masters. He had the restaurant Thano's Lamplighter in Ann Arbor. And his family's from Greece. And so I don't know if that was part of it or not, but, you know, the Michigan alumni base, man, is global. And 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 it's, it's extended, man. It's a, it's a very extensive uh, group, man. And you know, I tell people all the time: if you want to choose a college, choose a college to where after you graduate, that degree is gonna have volume, man. It's gonna have legs to it. To where now you might walk into. A, I'll give you a prime example. You know, one of my cars in the shop right now, man. And. The guy that's my rep is a Michigan alumni, man. He's hooking me up big time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I love man. It. It, it, it. It's extended all over the world. And how do you feel about Jawan Howard coming back to coach Michigan? Oh, I think it's beautiful, man. You know, because, you know, I've been doing Jawan since he first came to Michigan. And um, I know how hard they recruited him. But Jawan is a Michigan man. And it, if anybody else was qualified for that job, it was him because he put the work in. You know, he went after he got done playing. You know, he went into the into the rooms, man, and, and learned everything he could from Spoelstra and uh, and Coach Riley. Uh, he paid his dues, man. Most people like, well, he doesn't have any head coaching experience, but he has basketball experience. That's right. And and so I thought it was a great hire. You know, Ward Manuel called me and asked me my opinion before they hired, as he did a lot of us on our squad. He called guys and asked me, how you feel about Juwan becoming the next head coach? And I gave him a thousand percent. I said, listen, man, that's the guy right there. Because listen, when, and you know how we were, Steve, when we were coming out. If, 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 you know, I always tell people, if you want to become a doctor, don't go play for a plumber. And, 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 so, <laughs> and so most top players, what they want to do, they want to get you to leave. That's right. So who better to teach you than somebody that's already been there? Great point. Great point. Yeah. I think, and, and Jawan's already, already shown, Sean, that on the recruiting trail, he's a beast because just what you're saying, guys that want to get to the league and, and no knock to any other coaches that didn't play in the league, but mm -mm. Jerry Stackhouse, uh, Jawan Howard, uh, Penny Hardaway, these guys are going to have an advantage, I think, moving forward for guys that can't go right out of high school when they change the rule, but for guys that, feel like they can develop at the college level and get to the NBA level. Jawan Howard's got to be one of the first places you think about, doesn't it? No, it has to be, man. Out of those guys, all you all the guys you mentioned, they're going to have an advantage. Yep. They're going to have a huge advantage. You know, I can remember when I first um, was hired at the JUCO up in Seattle. My AD was like, man, once we put your press release out, I was getting calls from other schools. They're like, why would you hire this guy that played in the NBA at this level? to coach, he's going to have a recruiting advantage over us. I mean, the other coaches in the conference, they were pissed off. 
<laughs> and, and, and and I recruited my butt off, man. I had kids coming to play for me from overseas. I couldn't offer them a scholarship. They paid their own way because they knew I could get them to the next level. Mm, okay. I love it. You know, my, my three years at the JUCO, man, I sent 27 kids to four-year schools, and we never made the playoffs. Wow. So you developed but, the kids. Yeah, that's all I was about. At the JUCO level, it's all about player development. You know, God controls wins and losses anyway. All we control is the preparation. That's real. That's real. Sean, how do you feel? I, let me preface it by saying this. For me, today's NBA sometimes is hard to watch because it's all pace and space. That's all they do. Everybody copycats everybody else. It seems the league has tried to follow what Golden State was doing, but Golden State had the best shooting backcourt in the history of the game, and so that's really hard to emulate. What do you think about the way the game is being played right now at the NBA level? Well, the league's always been a copycat league. I mean, when the bad boys was out, everybody's playing bully ball after that. The Knicks, everybody tried to play bully ball. So the NBA, and everybody in the league, they run the same place. You know, the NBA is universal. You can't reinvent the wheel. They just call the play something else. It's the same play. Right. You know, but you can't, this is what I tell guys all the time, man. You got to, you got to take your, your strategy and adapt to your personnel. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just play the same way all the time. And like you said, you know, they got the Splash Brothers in, in Golden State. So you got to have supreme shooting to play like that. That's right. If not, you got to do you. And, and so the NBA has always been a copycat league. You know, I, I can watch the NBA game, man. I fall asleep on most of them because I can predict what's getting ready to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. Sean, we're – uh, where can people find you on social media? Okay. Um, my IG is at Higg, H-I-G-G, 1968. My Facebook is uh, Higg and Sean. And uh, my Twitter account is at um, Sean Higgins Live. Okay. All right. Well, one of these days, man, I want to get uh, you and Glenn and maybe Terry Mills uh, – together, man, to do a show because I think the Michigan fan base, the Big Ten fan base, and college basketball fan base would be elated to see you guys all together talking about Michigan stories. I think no, that we got a ton of stories, man. You need to get those guys. I talked to Terry and Glenn. Uh, I talked to Glenn yesterday, and I talked to Terry the day before yesterday. Okay. Well, we're going to yeah, make Those are my brothers, man. We close just like you guys. I watched a segment with you, Urban Small, and Lib, and Larry. You know, you guys remind us so much of ourselves, man. And that, that's why we had the battles we used to have, man. It's because yep. we looked at you guys just like us. That's right. And and right. It, it was almost like fighting your brothers. You know? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and, and so, man, I love that segment you guys did, man. And it would be good if you could get all of us on here, like Kenny Battle, man. You know, I always tell the story about Kenny Battle. I, the first time I ever heard Kenny Battle speak, I was like, who was that? You know, because Kenny, Kenny Battle, Kenny Battle plays so beastie, man. He was dunking on people and, yep. and talking. But as soon as he started talking, like, come on, man, let's yep. get it. You know how he talk, right? <laughs> I was like, that's not Kenny Battle. <laughs> yep. yep. No, that's funny, man. We, we're going to make that happen, Sean. Hey, man, thanks so much for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap up the show now. I want you to check in with your family members, check in with your loved ones. This is a critical time. We'll get through this together, but be positive and be strong. All right. Until next time. Peace. Peace.